was thinking about because of Pentecost happening, um, the relationship between the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, very specifically the Holy Spirit that's offered that Jesus Christ had when he came to earth, you know, he was born apparently with this because the spirit of Jesus Christ was recognized by his cousin, um, John the Baptist, while they were still in the womb, he, he, uh, John leaped up for joy in the womb of, uh, of Mary's cousin. So this is like John the Baptist recognizing, you know, even in the womb, his mission, his job. And, um, it got me realizing because when Jesus died, he rose from the dead and he said, you know, like 50 d days later, Pentecost would happen. And this is when the Holy Spirit would, would fall like fire upon people and they spoke in different tongues and the miraculous things of God occurred. And it's like the opening of ears, the opening of ideas, I, like full understanding. That's what it kind of like that, that fact that after they received the Holy Spirit, it, people around them all heard their own native language. I think this is symbolic. I think what God is saying is, because a lot of people go, oh, that means you should be able to hear different languages as easily as you hear English, or you should be able to speak, you know, every and all different languages, or it, it's a reference to that very spiritual language of angels that you see people in churches, um, you know, the charismatics and all that. Well, it's all different forms and levels of this language thing. Apostle Paul goes on about it, and I'm not going to go about it right now. It's very complicated. I do. I did a video on it. Anyhow, I think this is God's way of saying that the Holy Spirit opens up your eyes and enlights you to the truth, you know, that which is 100% applicable to your life. And also, you know, specific types of expectations that the world places upon you. You know, it really likes, the, the world really likes to distract you. And it likes to say, but you're not famous. You should be famous. You're not rich. You should be rich. You should have a, your soulmate. You and your soulmate should be together. Um, it has all these different things. You know, your your body needs to be 100% perfect. You're not you're not disciplined enough, which is true. I, I think this to a degree with the balance is, is accurate, actually accurate. You shouldn't be 100% poor, but you shouldn't be striving to be wealthy just for the sake of being wealthy. Um, to lord it over other people or to say you have the biggest yacht or whatever. There's a balance. But what I've been really realizing is what's lost in the ritual. What's lost in the ritual is the relationship with God, you know, because sometimes we get so stuck in doing a ritual and doing a thing that we forget to consult God. We go, well, my relationship with God depends on me doing this ritual. Um, that's why I have to be zealous for this. This is why Jesus was put on the cross. It's because people said, we love God so much that we're going to make sure that God can see we will not tolerate, you know, air quotes, lunatics, he's either Lord or lunatic, um, to run around saying they, the words I am with the implication that they are God. No, we're, we are very zealous. And I'm not talking about a group of people. I'm just talking about people in general. And so we're going to destroy him and we're going to make a, uh, we're going to make a show of him because we want everybody else to know that our God should be loved and respected. But do you see the problem in that? Do you, do you see the people in the fringes that are lost. I mean, let's say for ridiculous sake, he was a lunatic. If Jesus Christ was a lunatic, is that how you treat people who are mentally ill? That that lacks a lot of com compassion and our God is compassionate. I've also been thinking about how in order for that Holy Spirit, because I, I get so caught even in the ritual of the Holy Spirit, like thinking about the natural law, the spiritual law, in the tradition itself and how they all come together. And I get so lost in those details and how amazing the evolution, the, the upgrade of the, the tradition and the law of God gets just all of a sudden pushed up into a place that's just impossible. And it's like, if the Holy Spirit convicts me, I'm like, why, why is the Holy Spirit convicting me with this? All of a sudden it just falls right in with one of the 10 commandments. I'm like, Oh, I can literally trace the fact that my heart posture, not even something I did, just something I thought, my heart posture on something was sitting in such a place where God's like, uh, oh, 
You didn't love your neighbor by doing that. You didn't, because you thought that and because you felt resentment and because you, you came from a place of not wanting to understand them because you needed to feel so understood more than that other person that you're willing to bear false witness against them in order to be heard, which happens all the time in the media. It's happening to Israel right now, actually. Um, people are bearing false witness against them because they need to have a place to be, um, a political victim and to stand on a stage and to uh, turn their back on the president, which whatever, I don't like Biden anyway, but like, it's so, it's just so fake. All of it is so fake and it's about your ego and it's about what you are trying to make yourself out to be. I need to be seen as somebody who's standing up for good things, for right things, but you're willing to do that to the point of bearing false witness. And so that's what's happening to Israel. People are bearing false witness against them because it's easy. It's an easy place to get the things that you need to be fulfilled. But then you go on with your life. The Palestinians still starve. The Jewish are hated, you know, because they always have been. And nothing's changed, but at least you feel better. It's very selfish. Um, And so I got really caught up in like that kind of, and it kind of hit a, a wall. Where it's like, okay, now now you, the Holy Spirit made it clear, now you are stepping in a place of, instead of getting caught in the details of how the Holy Spirit will, will file certain things that I do into different places and I feel condemned and all this stuff. It's like, this really, what this all boils down to is a relationship with God. It's about God walking with you and saying, your sanctification that needs to occur. When you come into the presence of God, which I kind of want to do a short story about this because I really don't know how else to express it. It's a very difficult thing to express. And and I started really thinking about this um, when I was reading, there's this book that I'll put on the screen uh, that we're reading as a group. And one of the chapters is fear. And I really started considering the last time I was afraid. It was like 2018. It was the last time I was truly deeply afraid. And I I've always been shook by this experience because it had nothing to do with the environment, even though I thought it did. Nothing to do with the people I was with. Had, I thought it did, but it didn't. I believe that during this time frame, God was refining me. And I believe the presence of God, I believe I, I entered the presence of God. And I don't know how, but I was just living my life, traveling to New York. I don't know if it's because I was in New York or because I was kind of like feeling sick at this time because I had a lot of... um headaches and I was getting a fever. Maybe it was something like pre-COVID. I don't know what happened, but I, I couldn't sleep. I was just having just such a breakdown. And that was the first time I ever felt a fear I've never, like I've never experienced before. It was horrible, crippling fear. And I really think that was God confronting me and making it clear, like you, there's something's wrong. Like something's very wrong. And I couldn't, there was nothing around me to be afraid of, but I felt it deep within me and it felt in a place that like it's spiritual. And ever since then, all the way through COVID, I never felt anything like it. I've been sailing above it like stars and moon above anything that could ever make me afraid. I am not afraid because the spirit of fear is not of God. And I, but I, what I do know is if you come into the presence of something that you're not supposed to encounter or you're doing something wrong that is causing a conviction that makes you afraid of the of something God is trying to convey that you're not able to grasp or comprehend. And that's the place I had to come to where I'd said to God, I know this fear isn't from God, the fear itself, but there's something that's happening in my life that God was very directly looking at and confronting and I couldn't sort it. And Sometimes I get so caught in the in the Holy Spirit aspect of it and trying to file it away and find a place for it that God has to remind me. This isn't just about the spanking, if I can say that. It's about the relationship. It's about you should at some point understand that when you walk with a God that is bigger than all of the universe a few times over, many, many infinite times over, that knows parts of you you don't understand, that knows why you were created, and has a comprehension of reality that's above your understanding, that this is scary. And when you come into his presence, you're going to feel completely inferior. And so that's recently what I've been, what the Holy Spirit seems like has been working on me about, is that I 
I've been very angry and I think it's because I feel kind of like I think the word is inferior I think what it is is I get so busy trying to maintain the standard that it's like but are you turning off your brain are you choosing not to see things are you choosing to go dead emotionally and psychologically what kind of relationship can you have with God with this you know, it's just like Job. Job yelled at God. Now, should you be cussing and cursing him? No. But the whole God, thank God the Holy Spirit can translate what you say. And what is it to have a relationship, like a friendship with God? What did Jacob do? He wrestled God. That's what Israel means. It means to wrestle with God. And what was he wrestling God for? He was wrestling him to be blessed. That's what he was wrestling him for, a blessing. And I do find it very interesting that one of the things that Jacob asked him was, what is your name? Because what is associated with name? It's, an, it's associated with character and, and something that came before you. Because if you think of John, you think of Apostle, you think of Jacob, you think of Israel. So Jacob was trying to not just because he saw the face of God and lived, but he was trying to also get the character of God. And what did the angel of the Lord, who we believe is Jesus Christ, say to Jacob? And this is also a, a foreshadowing of what happens in the end times in the book of Revelation when uh when the jewish people have to flee and they go to this place that means face and it's like similar to what jacob goes through it's, it's very i did a video on it it's whatever i don't want to go into it and he wants he wants this angel of god's name and the angel of god says why do you ask my name and he disappears but from that moment forward he Jacob actually named that place and he actually said, oh my gosh, you know, he, he ended up being the one who wrestled God. And that's us, you know, we wrestle God and we end up walking with a limp and sometimes it becomes frustrating. Like you, you're wrestling something you're never going to battle, like you're never going to win. And another, neither am I trying to win. What's going to happen is it's going to, it's going to refine your flesh. It's your flesh crying out and saying, but I really hate the fact that I have to leave this part of me behind. It's parts of you dying. So as parts of you die and become ashes, that that will not survive anywhere in heaven. It won't survive the presence of God. So life seems to, to me to be about God refining and part of that sanctification is pulling away those parts of you that you've identified with yourself and your own ego and your own identity pulling those parts of you away that you are going to kick and scream and say, but I really need this because this is part of what makes me a human being and giving up on things and saying, you know, I feel very defeated. Nothing in this reality says that doing this particular thing makes sense, but because, you know, I want to stay ritualistic. I want to stay within uh, my own earthly law. I don't want to pay attention to God's law, but that's what this whole Holy Spirit thing is about. It's about God refining you. It's about a relationship with God. It's about God pointing things out and saying, but you do have this problem. And sometimes I get upset because I know it's there and I know he'll reveal the blind spot in time, but I'm very impatient. And I have to just be patient sometimes and let that just kind of play its way out. I want things to be just so. I want it to be filed away. I want it to be done in a specific order. I want a ritual. I want a routine. And that becomes your idol, you know? Because if it gets in the way of you being able to walk with God, then it's not, it's not, it's not valuable. It's garbage. You know, let us kill this guy who seems to be a lunatic. Let's put him on a cross because God will really know that we, we love him and we really want to respect him. But really, it's not about the guy blaspheming God at the end of the day. It's about something within you. It's a complex within you. It's nothing to do with God. God doesn't care if a lunatic runs around claiming that he's God. God doesn't care. I understand the order of things. I understand they're trying to keep it all, air quote, kosher within their folks, that you're not supposed to do that. But Jesus also was trying to explain to people through the healing of the woman with blood, healing of the woman that was crippled. He's trying to say something. He's trying to say this ritual of keeping these people to the outskirts of society is destroying your society because it's removing the potential for the unity, the love and the healing that God has planned for you. 
And that's through him, through the Holy Spirit, through what God has done through Jesus Christ. But it's really hard for human beings to do that kind of math. It's just the way people are. You know, I do it all the time. It's just a thing. Anyhow, um, I was also thinking about, I believe it's in the book of Exodus, where God remembered Israel. He remembered his promise to Jacob. I, I should say not Israel, but, you know, because at the time people were enslaved. Jewish folks were, the Jews were enslaved to Pharaoh. And God remembered them. It, it reminds me of the fact that our salvation came from God, not from us going, oh, wait, I remember God. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, let me get back to God. It's God remembering you. And saying, I will move these heavens, I will take the sun out of the sky, and I will bring a plague upon every house. And I will bring the, the flies, the frogs, the locusts, the darkness. I'll bring it all. Because I remembered you. And all these things are going to be moved, including that Pharaoh. I am going to move those things, and you are going to leave, and you're going to go to that place with it's flowing with milk and honey. Because I remembered you. Not them remembering him. He remembered them. And that's how God works in our own life. And it's really amazing because the Holy Spirit, this week being Pentecost, is all that proof. It's the whole proof. It's it's literally moving. If The hardest thing to move isn't that mountain over there. It's the thing within you. It's the thing that says you are your own God. That is the biggest thing in this whole universe. When I say you, I mean me. Um, just I know it makes no sense. And I know there's many things happening. But it's just the things I think about. And I figured I'd put it somewhere. So this is Linda of Christ's King forever. May God be with you.